So why am I here and why am I talking about this topic? Um, well, first of all, um, I was involved to some extent, yes, uh, but uh, for sure I was not somebody um, who had uh, any significant role in, in, in that universe, neither in the VBS scene nor in the early internet days. Um, I was just uh, basically uh, a youngster, a teenager who uh, had fun playing with technology and was helping others to, to communicate using technology. Uh, there are many more people who, have, uh, who are much more qualified than me to talk about that subject, but I, and that's the reason why I'm here and why I submitted this talk, is uh, you don't really see many people speaking about these days or about those topics anymore. Um, and even if you want to research it, I think there's like one or two books in German uh, on that subject. Uh, they're very hard to get and uh, also not very complete. Um, so uh, I think um, we have to um, uh, sort of... Uh, document the history a bit for those people who uh, have not been around uh, at the time. So uh, this talk will not have as many acronyms as you used to from talks that I usually give. Uh, still, you have typos in the slides, as you can see on the second line already, so uh, that didn't change. I didn't invent any of the technologies covered here. I didn't write any of the software covered. I was just a user and operator or sysadmin, and that's the world I grew up in from 11 onwards. Um, yeah, as I said, many people lack uh, that history. And uh, to start with that, uh, maybe a, a quick poll in the audience. Uh, who has ever dialed into a BBS using a modem? Raise your hands. Okay, so I'm preaching to the converted. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, maybe I should invite all of you up to the stage and we should make a, a discussion round instead. Uh, anyway, so... Um, yeah, circuit switch telephony. Well, this is the telephony from 1876 until about 1988 with analog voice circuits over copper wires and dial-up connections between A and B. I guess everybody still remembers these. Uh, even if you're young, you should have seen uh, a classic telephone, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, you have analog amplifiers possibly in the path, uh, and, uh, but actually the copper wires are physically switched at telephone exchanges. So this then structurally looks a bit like this. Uh, we have a telephone at one end, we have a telephone at another end, and we have uh, telephone exchanges or switches which actually switch the circuit, uh, hence the term circuit switch telephony, uh, between A and B. So you have a, a copper wire from your phone to the uh, office, uh, the exchange, to which you are connected, and then that exchange again has copper wires to other exchanges and so on, and uh, based on the phone number you dial, uh, the call is switched uh, to the destination subscriber. That's sort of the uh, foundation in terms of technology uh, that we're using here. Um, also something to document uh, for the international audience in Germany at that time, even local calls were metered and charged by the minute. Uh, flat rates didn't exist, and and uh, we had multiple zones, so there's not just local calls and long distance calls, but uh, different depending on your distance, so like up to 50 kilometers or more than 50 kilometers and so on. Um, and uh, given on that uh, and, and the steep pricing, uh, not so many people could afford long distance BVSing, at least not uh, for a long time. 
All of this started with a device called the Acoustic Coupler. Um, it's actually also how I started, even though I'm young and I only started in, uh, I think, about 90 or 91. Um, at 10 or 11 years of age, you don't have the latest and greatest in technology. I got a used uh, second-hand or third-hand Olivetti Acoustic Coupler. Um, uh, from my uncle. It had even a battery. It could be operated mobile. It had a battery compartment with eight Mignon cells. Um, uh, actually, I still own it, and I still own a related telephone. I just thought it, yeah, don't have to bring it here. But um, it, uh, it still exists. So anyway, here you have to dial using your normal phone. Uh, you dial the digits of the phone number, and once the other side picks up the phone, and they put their receiver onto the acoustic coupler, and you put your receiver onto the acoustic coupler, then uh, data can be transmitted over the telephone line, uh, as I said, with manual dial, manual pickup, and uh, rather extremely low speed. Um, this uh, all uh, looks, uh, yeah, looks, looks like this. And the next step in the logical progression then was modems, which is sort of, you can think of an automatized method of acoustic couplers where um, you don't have an air gap anymore. So in the acoustic coupler, you literally have a couple of centimeters of air between the speaker and the microphone in the receiver of your phone versus the acoustic coupler. So with a the modem, there's a direct uh, connection. Um, and also, you have automatic uh, facilities to dial the telephone number and to answer the line and so on. So you don't need a manual operator anymore to uh, pick up a phone or dial numbers. Um, and this thing gets transmitted over the, uh, over the telephone line. This is a stack of various different modems. We will see some others here. Uh, some of you will remember the brands or the shapes or even the specific models of those modems. Um, uh, but that's uh, too much uh, level of detail uh, for the moment. So uh, let's look a bit at the, the speeds uh, or lack of speed uh, that was available. Um, it started with 300 BPS. Uh, I actually used 300 BPS a couple of times uh, back in, uh, in, like I said, around 1990. Of course, it was extremely slow, but uh, still it was uh, uh, what I uh, could start with at the time, or then at the 1200 BPS. So this is still uh, rather slow, and you can, you can slowly read and follow the text as it's being printed. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an animation or something like that. I'm not such a multimedia uh, savvy guy. Um, uh, so, yeah, then the speeds progressed. Uh, you see the years in which they were created, the lines with the asterisk mark, uh, years uh, that I found some secondary sources that originally it had been specified then, but actually the oldest spec document for all these earlier ones was from 1988. So if you go to the ITU website, the earliest documents you can find are from 1988, and none of those earlier documents could at least on the internet be found anywhere. Maybe you can go to a library or something like that. Um, yeah, so speeds progressed, uh, different modulation schemes were introduced to squeeze ever more bits into these uh, 3 kilohertz analog circuit uh, over the telephone line. Um, and uh, every couple of years, a new, especially in the 90s, if you follow this, 91, 14.400 BPS, 93, 19.2, uh, 1994, uh, 28,000 bits per second. Um, and there were, of course, also proprietary uh, protocols. Then you had to have the same uh, manufacturer of modem uh, that the other side whom you're calling um, and so on. But these are the official standardized uh, uh, protocols and speeds that were used, which brings us so, okay, we, we have a telephone system. Um, we can dial numbers. We have a modem that can dial uh, numbers. Uh, we have modems that can send bits in uh, exceptionally uh, fast speed. Um, uh, what do we do with this? And this brings us to BBSs. Who, where could you actually dial and, and what could you do there? So what's a BBS? Fundamentally, it's uh, some computer any hardware, any operating system, any software, some computer that accepts incoming calls uh, attached to a modem and offers some kind of interactive service to the people who dial into uh, that BBS. And uh, if you wanted to operate a BBS, you had to have a separate dedicated computer for that, because at the time, uh, most of the BBS software uh, and most of the software that people used in general uh, predated multitasking operating systems. So when you ran the BBS, the computer was busy running, running the BBS. You couldn't do anything else at the same time. So um, you had to invest quite a bit into a sever separate second computer or third or fourth um, to actually operate that BBS. You had to have a separate telephone line 
um, because if you operate the VBS into which people dial into, of course, any time of the day or night, people will dial in there, so you cannot use your normal phone line that you use to make phone calls, but you had to have a sec separate dedicated phone line. Um, and of course, the system had to run uh, more or less 24-7, so people could dial in and reach it. Uh, luckily, on the user side, uh, there was not so many um, requirements in terms of technology that you needed. Uh, your computer, of course, you only power when you use it, uh, and you can share the regular phone line uh, with the side effect, as uh, in the introduction has been mentioned, that uh, your family might have uh, gone angry if you occupied it too long. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, no additional infrastructure other than a modem required. Now you dial into the BBS. What kind of content uh, do you get, or what what do you do in that BBS? Um, and the name BBS in in English is the Ballantine Board Service. That's actually the 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 acronym expansion. Um, so there were bulletin boards, message boards, where you could exchange messages and texts uh, with other people, other users of that uh, BBS, or the so-called sysop, the system operator, um, the guy running that BBS. Um, you could also chat with the system operator, which, uh, well, didn't exist before, the ability to chat with somebody else uh, remotely over a text-based terminal. Um, there were also multi-user games, uh, text-based, uh, as well as uh, so-called file areas where you could download files. And uh, downloading files, uh, given the speeds back then, and so on and so on, of course, uh, it was uh, not, uh, it was primarily text documents or small programs or something like that. Uh, um, MP3 didn't exist, of course, at least until 95 or whenever it, it came out, so maybe some mod files for your module tracker, um, or something like that. And, of course, of course, last but not least, uh, ASCII and ANSI artwork, which uh, basically is an entire uh, subculture and, and scene and community in itself, um, creating uh, artworks and drawings using the character set um, that was used by ANSI.sys, which was the, the DOS um, I could say display driver in quotes um, uh, in a certain character set and you could draw uh, graphics like this. Uh, we will see some more um, uh, and uh, people were putting a lot of effort into this um, and uh, sort of competing who could, who could make the best uh, representation or the, the most expressive artwork given the limited uh, resolution and the limited characters and colors available in uh, this uh, domain. So what kind of software did one use uh, or what kind of technology was used? Well, we already had the computer and modem. Um, you needed some software. So on the VBS side, uh, VBS software, uh, there's uh, an unlimited number of different VBS software programs and extensions and modifications thereof. Uh, a lot of them are freeware or shareware. Some of them are public domains. Some are actual free software. Um, some are proprietary uh, for any operating system for any computer architecture, people were writing VBS software, whether you had an Amiga or Atari or um, uh, you had Apple or uh, DOS PCs or you name it, um, uh, software was written uh, by hobbyists uh, primarily. Um, one concept that you will find in BBSs is, is the concept of so-called doors. Um, you can think of it as uh, similar to CGIs in web. So basically, you could the BBS software could call an external program which would then take over the input and output uh, to and from the user. So you could have sort of plugins to your BBS software which would add additional new games or uh, chat software or messaging or whatever. Um, on the user side, uh, you had a primarily a so-called terminal program. Um, it's called terminal program because actually it emulates uh, a serial terminal, um, which uh, is a dedicated hardware device uh, with a keyboard and a screen and a serial line, um, but not a general purpose computer. And in order to make a general purpose computer behave like a terminal, you had a, a terminal program on DOS, uh, which I was using at the time. It's primarily Telix and Telemate, I think, were the favorite ones, at least uh, uh, on this side of the planet. Um, and um, uh, you started that program, you had a serial port, uh, the serial port attached to your modem, and uh, from there you dialed, and the terminal program then was responsible of displaying the texts and the, the ANSI graphics and, uh, and so on, and exchanging files over a variety of different protocols, which uh, we will also cover 
later. But uh, before we go on, uh, let's do a quick demo uh, of how this looks like. Now, uh, as a note, uh, I'm not going, I don't have a modem here. I'm not emulating a modem. Um, I'm not emulating a serial port. Uh, these days you can get the same experience uh, by using Telnet over uh, the internet, but uh, you can actually Telnet into VVSs. I just want to uh, basically show how it uh, looks like. Um, so, um, this is the terminal program, and uh, we have now connected to the VVS. This is sort of an introductory uh, graphic that we see before even logging into the, the box. Um, yeah, some, of course, the scrolling was much slower back then. So now we can scroll back up to actually see what, what, what was there. Um, yeah, some more graphics. Uh, you still haven't seen the login prompt yet. As you can see, a fairly graphics heavy uh, BBS. Then you can choose the theme of the BBS user interface. Um, I'm going to go for the classic ANSI here. Finally, I come to a login screen um, and I can log into the system uh, where I have to en enter my handle and the password, which is now in clear text over Telnet. <laughs> For those of you interested in it, it's not that there's anything useful. I just registered this morning at the VVS, so there's nothing associated with this account. Yeah, some more graphics. Um, Finally, uh, we are at a uh, message board, and uh, we see, as I said, I just uh, logged in or registered at this PBS today. We see there is uh, a message number one from uh, Hawk Hubbard, a welcome. So if I uh, want to look at that message, I could uh, basically say I want to read it now. This is the message reader. I go in here, then here, uh, welcome LaForge, and so on. So he welcomes me to the PBS. Um, now, um, let's go to the main menu of the BBS, which in this case looks like that. Um, and uh, you have uh, different, uh, the file areas where you can download files. You have the Dory games that I mentioned. You have an ANSI gallery, a BBS list. You can look at the last callers uh, who has called uh, this mailbox. And you can see there's, well, uh, yeah, three test calls from me this <laughs> morning. Um, but you can see actually other people are still logging into this BBS and it's 2017. So um, it's not, uh, to me, this is mostly history. But during the preparation of this talk, I discovered that uh, some people, uh, for some people, it is still the present, and I'm very happy to see there's still such an active community around BBSs, um, and which enables me to show all of this uh, without firing up some emulators and, and so on. So, yeah, um, we also can look at uh, one-liners. Yeah, this is some messages that people can leave uh, to other people, uh, other users in the BBS, again, with some quite uh, graphical um, we don't want to leave any additional words here. Um, uh, but what, for example, we can look at the ANSI gallery uh, just very quickly. Um, can uh, try to select something here. I have no idea what I'm looking at, so... Ah, okay. So here you have a, a sort of a viewer that... Um, yeah. Yeah, so it, it will show you the sections of a sort of longer artwork in this, in this uh, particular case. Um, yeah, well, and the artwork. To me, there always was a lot of similarity between the uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, yeah, uh, between the, the ANSI art artists and uh, the, the people doing, um, uh, now I'm lacking the word, uh, uh, street art, um, basically. I think there's a lot of similarity between that. Okay, good, that was just a very quick demo. Of course, I could now look at more messages and, and write messages and play blackjack and do whatever I want, um, which I don't uh, in this case. So uh, we will log off. And again, some more graphics, and you can leave a comment to the sysop if you want, or you can just basically log off. Okay, um, that for a very quick demo of the look and feel. Now, um, since I'm such a technical person and looking at protocol stacks, I tried to draw a protocol stack diagram for BBSs, um, which uh, ended up at this. So basically, at the lower layers, we have the POTS, the plain old telephony system, or ISDN, uh, which we will get to in a few slides. 
Um, we had modems uh, on, the, on the analog telephone system. We had uh, other things on ISDN. In the end, at some point, you always have RS-232, a serial port, uh, either emulated or real. Um, and then either you had a terminal program directly on top of that, or, uh, for example, to transfer files, you uh, have used X modem or Y modem or Z modem, which added error correction and retransmission and block transmission, so you could safely transfer files without, uh, or at least uh, with less uh, corruption. Um, and the checksum algorithms were not so uh, scientific uh, in many uh, cases. Um, here we then have well some other things, FTN point, uh, what is that, UCP, uh, we will cover that later. Um, uh, basically you could run different protocols and different systems on top of that. Um, one curiosity that I still want to mention is that, um, which I, I actually I forgot until on Twitter somebody reminded me a couple of days ago that this existed and I went, mean, oh yes, RIP term. Um, I, I used that quite some time ago. Um, so instead of having these text-based user interfaces, uh, some people, a company called Telegraphics, came up with a, a language called RipScript, which was a, a fairly compact language of textual commands by which the BTS could control a, um, a vector graphic renderer on the client side in your terminal program. And you could actually draw uh, EGA resolution graphics like the one that's uh, presented here on the slide uh, from the VBS on the screen of the user, which was uh, quite a big uh, change uh, compared compared to the uh, ASCII art uh, or ANSI art uh, that you've seen before. Yeah, so we're still at BBSs and uh, VBSs that are isolated. So you can participate in those bulletin boards and you can read and write messages and, and exchange ideas and recipes and thoughts and cheat codes and whatever you want to exchange. Uh, users log in at different times. Uh, the VBS is busy if it has only a single line uh, while it's being used uh, by some other user. Of course, you can add as a VBS operator, as a sysop, you can add more modems and more phone lines, which is, of course, expensive. Uh, together with the multi-port serial cards and, and, and everything that was required. Um, you can have time limits for each user. Um, yeah, but in the end, it's sort of, there's a limit to how far you can scale a single BTS, uh, sorry, not BTS, BBS, oh, GSM, um, a single BBS. Uh, well, also there's a scalability limit for BTSs, but that's another talk. Um, so, yeah, which brings us to um, one method of uh, more efficiently engaging uh, with BTSs uh, for uh, exchanging messages, which is the concept of points or offline message reading. Um, so, as we have just seen uh, in this example, we log into the, BP, uh, the BBS um, and uh, we, we have a, an online interactive session with the BBS while we read and write the messages. And of course, it means we occupy the, the telephone line for an extended period of time um, and uh, it's not used very efficiently because humans typically read slower than at least 14.4 uh, or 28 kilobits uh, per second. Um, so uh, people invented uh, something called points uh, or offline message reading and different concepts, different uh, systems, different standards, different technologies. Uh, what they did in the end is uh, they uh, compressed and batched all the messages for you uh, into files. Um, and you on your um, client side, you were writing your messages offline and also compressing and batching the messages that you've written. And then you make a call. You quickly exchange those files in both directions, even in full uh, if the system supports it, um, and, and then you terminate the connection again. So during a very short call, you can exchange much more, uh, many more messages, and you have all the time uh, to read through those messages without having to look at the phone meter uh, or your phone bill all the time. So more scalability, more users, shorter connection time, uh, lower cost for everyone involved, uh, definitely an interesting technology. Um, uh, but still, sort of scalability is limited of a single BTS, which uh, BBS, uh, which brings us to BBS networks, um, store and forward networks, uh, which uh, basically extended um, the ability to exchange messages beyond a single uh, BBS. Uh, but so basically, the bulletin boards or the message groups that you had at a BBS were replicated over 
different protocols that were invented by various different people over time. Um, so uh, not only one BBS had all the messages of a given uh, bulletin board, but all the other BBSs uh, participating also uh, were receiving uh, these messages and replicating them all over the network. Also for personal mail, um, uh, which is like email, uh, right, between two uh, participants, um, you could route those messages across the network. The two users exchanging messages didn't have to connect to the same BBS anymore. Uh, so much more scalability, um, and also you could use it efficiently for message routing uh, to reduce uh, the need for long distance calls and so on. So let's look at a couple of these uh, BBS networks and uh, uh, the technologies they used. One uh, large and very popular example, of course, is the FIDO network. Um, which consists of two parts, NetMail and EchoMail. Um, NetMail is the, the private personal mail and EchoMail are public um, message boards or um, message groups. Um, uh, Fido had some, the technology used by Fido called FTN, Fido Technology Networks, uh, were used also by other networks. They were using the same protocols, but they were not uh, the same uh, group of BBSs or the same uh, content and so on. Treknet uh, for Star Trek fans was one, Garnet in Germany um, uh, was an example for that. Um, there also were other uh, technologies in other networks such as Znets. Uh, where they called it Bretter, actually, so boards, uh, the individual um, uh, message groups. Um, and again, they had other offsprings uh, that used the same technology but had different groups and different policies and different structures, uh, such as TNets or CLNets. Um, uh, and then there was the big uh, faction of people who did UUCP, um, the Unix to Unix copy. Um, which we will look at a little bit. And Mausnet is another German example here, uh, uh, originating from the city of Münster, um, which uh, was used to up to 120 BBSs uh, here. Um, let's look at Fido a little bit more. Uh, started uh, allegedly in 1984. Um, of course, I uh, was not involved at that time, uh, at the age of five. Um, it uh, reached a limit of 250 nodes in 1985, because apparently, I suppose, probably a single uh, uint8 was used for the node number or something like that, and then, uh, well, 250 should be sufficient for everyone. I don't know what the other five are for. Um, uh, and then they introduced in 86 uh, hierarchic regional routing and addressing um, uh, that uh, was more scalable. And in the end, uh, at the peak of the FidoNet uh, propagation, there was uh, 39,000 nodes. And that's BTS, uh, BBSs, not uh, individual users, but uh, 39,000 uh, BBSs were interconnected with an estimated 2 million users worldwide. And that's uh, for a you know, hobbyist uh, um, uh, amateur network is, uh, I think, quite... Uh, uh, impressive. The addresses looked like this. Um, that's actually a node number that I used around 95 um, uh, uh, in uh, Nuremberg at the time. Znets uh, started as uh, Zalboros Nets, um, and I'm not sure if Padelun or Rina or any of the people involved are in the audience. If then, I hope I represent uh, the history correctly. Um, which is uh, a network um, a technology created in Germany. The standards are inspired, uh, but different than the Usenet and UUCP protocols, and there were all kinds of flame wars about who understood the specs wrong and whether there's an improvement between ZConnect uh, compared to the Usenet standards or not. Um, uh, but anyway, it was different, um, and uh, there was one program called Crosspoint, which was the most popular point software at the time, I think at least on DOS, um, uh, for Znets and also for other technologies, the screenshot here at the bottom actually is a, is a Crosspoint screenshot. Um, and Crosspoint in the early 90s already had features um, that I'm still missing today uh, in any email client that I have found, um, right? Uh, imagine you have uh, an, a, thread, a thread that crosses multiple folders, multiple news groups, multiple whatever, and you have uh, threading, uh, like the tree of the thread across folders and news groups and so on. I mean, that's something that you cannot do with, with any of the software still today. Maybe you have, uh, you have an answer uh, which software today supports this, but for sure nothing I have found uh, uh, has the kind of features and functionality. 
Unfortunately, it was written in Pascal and it had a line length limit of 255 characters per line, uh, which made it not very compatible to use net standards where lines could have uh, different lengths. So um, one couldn't uh, continue to use it uh, in today's uh, time and age, uh, at least not easily. Usenet is another uh, network of these uh, BBS days. Um, where um, uh, messages were exchanged by a system called Unix to Unix copy. Uh, Unix to Unix copy predates the Usenet. It was used, well, as the name implies, to copy something between Unix machines, uh, file copying. Um, and some of those files that people were copying were internet mail at the time. And um, uh, then the Usenet news format was invented. Uh, the format is quite similar to internet mail, which we still know today, um, but it's not a personal mail between person A and person B, but it, uh, you, you could post it to a so-called news group, and there was a hierarchy of news groups uh, which uh, replicated and flooded uh, messages across uh, the entire network across the globe. Um, and there was a, a flooding mechanism uh, in, in, uh, involved to make sure that the messages get replicated and the duplicates get detected and duplicates are not uh, um, uh, basically uh, transmitted again or rather shown again. Um, and so on. Um, the, the routing was originally defined in route maps in UCP, uh, uh, which is uh, quite a bit odd uh, over time um, um, uh, because it's basically a static uh, source-based routing for, for the UCP mails. Uh, news, as I said, they, they were flooding anyway. Um, Usenet was uh, quite popular uh, until well into the 90s. Um, I was newsmaster of uh, two news servers for some time, um, basically doing system administration of those boxes. And just to give you an anecdote again uh, into this context, uh, we will get to Kommunikationsnetz Franken, which is an, a non-profit organization in uh, the area of Franconia in southern Germany. Um, where I was active and uh, at the time uh, internet like when we actually got to IP uh, at some point IP traffic was so expensive that it was rather difficult to get a full news feed over IP because you wasted a lot of your expensive bandwidth on well, wasted in quotes but you used it uh, for news um, so what we did actually is we put up a satellite dish at a building in Nuremberg um, and we had satellite feeds from the US so there was a, a, a US company that were streaming compressed Usenet batches up to a, a geostationary satellite which has a downlink over Europe um, and then we got two megabits uh, of compressed batched Usenet news uh, in I would say let's say 95-ish or something like that. So um, that uh, was definitely a big improvement uh, so we, we had uh, a full news feed uh, coming directly from the US uh, um, without having to pay for all the international data transfers. Another curiosity is the floppy polar point. Now, nobody is laughing yet. Um, well, not everyone had phone lines in the 90s, uh, particularly in Eastern Germany, phone lines were still a rare commodity um, after reunification happened in uh, 90. Um, took some time until people could get connected to the telephone network and uh, so what people did is actually they exchanged daily floppies by uh, postal mail. So basically, rather than sending your compressed batches of messages um, over modems, uh, because, well, for modem you need phone lines, um, you put a floppy, uh, I would assume 3.5 inch at the time, uh, not so much uh, uh, four and a quarter inch, uh, but um, uh, you put a floppy in an envelope, you send it to your, uh, to your BBS, and the guy opens the envelope and puts it in the BPS, uh, and he sends you a floppy in return. So you add one day or something to your transmission, but then, well, the messages, the transmission speed of messages in those networks at the time was sort of one to two days, or maybe even three days anyway, so if you add another day, what does it matter? It was, it was, uh, such a big advantage that you could get messages like worldwide messages at all in such a short time uh, and for basically no uh, cost uh, whatsoever. Okay, getting to the internet. Yeah, um, how uh, did I start to access internet or how did people uh, start to access the internet at the time? Well, mail and news was sort of the internet uh, in the beginning uh, via UCP, um, which uh, is uh, nice and fine, uh, but it's not IP yet. Um, 
So what you could do is you could, instead of dialing into a BBS, you could of course use your modem to dial to the uh, serial port to the TTY of uh, any Unix machine that's somewhere else. So if you have a Unix workstation somewhere that's connected to an IP network uh, using uh, 10 base 2 or whatever was the network technology uh, at the time, or FDDI or whatever, uh, x21, um, then uh, you could attach a modem to a serial port of such a Unix box and you can you just get the login prompt when you, when you uh, connect with the modem to that box. Uh, like you sit in front of your Linux system today, um, you have your login prompt. And uh, then on that wor workstation, you basically you could remotely use that workstation. Um, and then you could run FTP clients or IRC clients or Telnet, Gopher, whatever on the text console. Um, that was uh, mostly uh, available to people in the academic sector, of course, uh, because they had some Unix machines at universities. Um, I was too young to be at university, so um, uh, I had to use FTP mailers for quite some time. So what's an FTP mailer? Well, it's basically some FTP client that runs on a remote machine somewhere that's connected to the internet and that has email access, and you can use input-output over email. So if you want to FTP to some uh, FTP server, you send an email, it says FTP, FTP to the server and an LS. And then some hours later you get a response with the list of the files. Yeah? And then after you got the list of the files, you do the first CD to change into a directory and then you get again the response. Um, and then finally you know which file you want, so you issue a get command over the file, and then you get this long series of UUN-coded uh, mails. UUN-code is a me method of, uh, of, of sending binary 8-bit uh, messages over mails before MIME existed, the MIME uh, format which we use today for email attachments and so on. That didn't exist at the time, so it was UEN code before. So yeah, so hours or days later you, you got that. And it, it, it worked perfectly fine. I mean, I was, I was uh, quite happy uh, uh, to be able to use that at the time. Now then, if you had dial-up access to a Unix box, you could also do something called SLIP, um, uh, which uh, is a serial line IP. Um, so uh, you could transport IP over the modem line um, and as a result uh, you have IP at home in your apartment. Um, unbelievable. Uh, it was later superseded by PPP which introduced features such as auto configuration, authentication, compression and so on. Well there was a compressed slip but yeah not, not quite as compressed as PPP. And a popular software stack at the time, um, and I'm talking about early 90s, mid 90s, um, is uh, basically Trumpet Windsock on Windows with NCSA Mosaic um, as a browser. Because Windows back then didn't have TCP IP, so you had to install another package uh, to actually have TCP IP on, on Windows at the time. Um, if you didn't have Windows, I will get to that. Um, and I'm talking about the pre Linux days here. So, uh, what did you do if you wanted to do internet on a PC before Linux was around? I didn't have a 386 initially, I had a 286. And on a 286, of course, you couldn't run any multitasking operating system because it doesn't have a real protected mode. Um, so no Linux, no BSD. Um, but there was something called KA9Q NOS. And now I want to see hands who has ever heard of or used KA9Q NOS. Yeah, okay. <laughs> huh? Yes, this is a person's call sign was the comment from the audience. This is correct. Um, KA9Q is Phil Karn uh, in the US, and he wrote a network operating system, the KA9Q NOS, the network operating system. Um, and it is an implementation of, he started actually in the 80s with this on CPM and then later ported it to DOS and it implements TCP IP, SLIP, PPP, including POP3 server, SMTP server client, IP routing, Telnet, ARP, and so on. And you could do all this on DOS. I, I used it quite a lot uh, at my home. Uh, you could do routing and you had multiple applications at the same time all on top of DOS. It uh, was a fantastic piece of software. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, you could build a router to Ethernet and you could have multiple other machines in your home um, and uh, you have more and more cable in your home. Um, and more and more connected machines. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, we will get to that. Okay, PPP superseded that. Um, at some point, ISDN came around, particularly in Germany. Um, ISDN is a digital uh, version of a uh, telephony system, so instead of having analog uh, circuits, you now transfer uh, digital bits um, that could be audio, digitized audio, but of course it could be any other transparent digital data. 
Um, in uh, Germany, ISDN was first uh, put in operation uh, in 1989. Um, until 93, it used a German protocol standard called 1TR6, and from 94 onwards, the European EDSS1 uh, protocol standard was available. It was hugely uh, popularized from 1995 onwards by subsidies. So at the time, if you, if you actually ordered an ISDN connection, and at the same time you bought a, uh, let's say, a, um, a small PBX um, or a phone or a modem or something like that, you got subsidies from, Do uh, from Deutsche Telekom. Um, so uh, I think it went up to 700 marks. I'm not sure if, if somebody remembers the exact figures. Um, and uh, so you got quite a bit of money to, to buy equipment uh, to switch to this new technology. So on ISDN, you don't have a modem uh, because there's nothing to modulate or demodulate. It's digital. So it's called a terminal adapter. And it adapts um, the, um, uh, the, the, the bit stream, the synchronous serial bit stream of the ISDN uh, to, your, um, uh, to your operating system or your, your computer. Um, and there was something called V.110 as a rate adapter adaptation to do asynchronous serial like RS-232 sort of over uh, synchronous ISDN. Okay, and how did we get internet access? Um, well, um, it was, uh, if you're not in academia or something like that, uh, there were a few commercial ISPs like Xlink or EUNet. Uh, they were very expensive and, uh, of course, you didn't have local dial-in in all the different uh, um, cities around uh, Germany, but you had grassroots groups of enthusiasts that uh, established themselves in, in some uh, associations uh, to, to make sure um, the members can get uh, internet access. In uh, my region, in Nuremberg, uh, Kommunikationsnetz Franken was particularly active. Um, they started with dial-up UCP services uh, and later for IP for non-commercial users. And I have to say, with an extremely high technical standard, which I'm still fascinated by today. Um, uh, Kommunikationsnetz Franken had uh, points of presence in various different cities in the region, because not everybody could call to Nuremberg uh, as a local call. Um, and every user got six static IP addresses uh, routed to wherever he dialed in. The use of OSPF in the mid-1990s to make sure you have static IP addresses wherever you dial in. Uh, some people still don't have that in uh, 2017. Um, I'm not even talking about the static IP addresses, but uh, anyway. So um, about 800 users peak uh, at that uh, association at the time. Um, and uh, there was an umbrella organization called Individual Network EV, um, IN. Um, this uh, was established. Uh, individuals could not become members in that association, so it's, uh, the name is a bit interesting. It's called Individual Network because it's about networking for individuals, but the members were the regional associations such as Kommunikationsnetz Franken, who then um, uh, basically used this um, umbrella entity to negotiate decent rates uh, to get uh, internet connectivity and so on. And uh, apparently uh, the IN members served more than 300,000 um, users at some point, so it scaled quite a bit. It was dissolved in 2000 when lots of commercial ISPs were around and also when the remaining uh, member entities, which many of which still exist today, such as Kommunikationsnetz uh, Franken, uh, they didn't need this umbrella entity to get decent internet uh, rates or tariffs again. So, with packet switch TCP IP, we just need one number that we call at some point. We're not dialing into hundreds of different VPSs anymore, but we're actually connecting always to the same number, which is our ISP. Um, and then when we have that connection, we exchange packet uh, data with uh, systems worldwide, uh, which brought new purpose to leased lines. Um, uh, analog leased lines were basically telephone lines that uh, were permanently switched or actually permanently wired at the exchange. So you had two wires of copper uh, between one location and another location, and they were physically connected. You could apply a DC voltage, and the DC voltage would come out at the other end. Um, you could uh, get this from uh, Deutsche Post or Telekom at the time when I could finally afford one uh, in 98 uh, for 900 marks installation cost and one, in my case 180 marks per month um, was 60 marks per hop. Uh, this, uh, hop means a telephone exchange. So if between the other end where you want to connect to and where you are are three telephone exchanges, you had three times 60 marks, so 180 marks per month. 
And then I connected to a system that looked like this, which is called the Hub Nuremberg um, of uh, this Kommunikationsnetz Flanken, which is in the basement of some of, of one of the members. Uh, you have basically a, a PC running Linux uh, or FreeBSD. No, it was FreeBSD actually, um, with like a 16-port serial card um, and various modems uh, stacked on various shelves. Uh, to interconnect all these different lease lines, and which then had one ISDN lease line uh, with 128 uh, kilobits uh, to some internet uplink. Yeah, that's the uh, obligatory um, uh, ISDN network termination and telephone uh, sockets. Um, which brings us to ISDN lease lines. There was a product called SPV, Semi Permanente Festverbindung. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, which is not really a lease line, it's semi-permanent, um, and it's basically a flat rate call to one specific destination telephone number, uh, which you could get in national 1TR6 ISDN, and which was rather inexpensive and what many people used who wanted more than the ISDN speeds. Okay. I have to speed up a bit, uh, time is running out. Uh, the first step of abusing analog lines, which we did, is by deploying a device called an ICUT, uh, which is the inverse of an ISDN NTBA. So in ISDN, you have the, still the telephone exchange and you have a network termination, the NTBA, on your line. And uh, basically, the, um, the, the ICUT was a single line um, telephone exchange side of this protocol. So you could use an analog line, which you normally used for analog modems, but you remove the two analog modems you put an NTBA on one end, you put the ICUT on the other end, and suddenly you can get 128 kilobits over that line, which previously you could only do 33.6 without having to pay any additional cents or uh, money to uh, Deutsche Telekom, of course. And then there were some special ISDN routers which could use the signaling channel, the 16K signaling D channel on ISDN also for data, so you get uh, 128 plus 16 kilobits of data, because, well, there's no signaling, you're not dialing anyone, so you can as well use that. Now, this is sort of the hierarchy of the leased line infrastructure at this entity. Uh, I'm not showing every leased line here, but basically I was at the upper left corner here, connecting with 33.6K to this hub Nuremberg, which connects to 128K to a machine in uh, a Nuremberg building of the University of Erlangen, which then connects over X21 to the University of Erlangen, uh, where then all kinds of other leased lines come together. Um, that was uh, the, the, the architecture of what we deployed there. Some more pictures. Uh, this is in Fürth, a neighbor city of Nuremberg, uh, the collection of telephone outlets and the collection of modems and the machine. Oh, there was, ah, I'm missing one picture, sorry for that. Uh, anyway, you can see a, a pile of modems here and some more modems here and the machine over there. Uh, and then we went into phase two of abusing analog telephone lines uh, when the first DSL modems came out. So uh, we imported some ascent DSL pipes uh, in 99 from the US uh, and uh, with some firmwares you could operate them back to back without a DSLAM. So basically you operate one DSL modem at one end of the lease line, another DSL, uh, another DSL modem at the other end. And if you are close enough, like with a single hop at a single telephone exchange, you could get up to 2.3 megabits symmetric over your analog line. Um, and that in 1999 was quite a lot of speed, um, especially if you're not uh, uh, paying for traffic or anything like that. Some less alternative, less expensive one alternatives came out. Okay, before I wrap up, um, uh, a short detour or one thing still to mention, uh, another phenomenon back then, I'm not sure if this happened in other cities too, in, in, in my area in Fürth we had an entity called Falcons Maze, which was called an online bistro. Um, I became a regular there around 94. Uh, they initially had four DOS PCs, each of them with a modem and with a dedicated uh, call charge meter. And you could basically go there, it's a cafe, you can have, it can, you, know, you can eat and drink and so on, and you can sit at a uh, PC and you can then from there dial into BT, uh, BBSs and, and basically do things if you didn't have a modem or a PC at home. But the interesting part, of course, was that the, all the other peoples were hanging out, the other BBS users, sysops, and so on. Um, at some point, uh, the PCs were networked with 10Base2, um, uh, so people could play Doom uh, uh, when it came out, I think in, uh, I'm not sure when it reached us in Germany, 94 maybe or so. Um, and uh, yeah, the internet became more popular, it started subsidiaries and uh, we set up ISDN SPVs, the semi-permanent verbindung, as an internet uplink uh, from there. Um, so that uh, also, I mean, uh, 
you can find some sources that this apparently or allegedly was the first internet cafe. I'm not sure if anyone else has contested that, something like that. Anyway, after lots of anecdotes, I want to give you some time for Q&A. Uh, to summarize, um, uh, the first decades of wide area communications were powered by a community of enthusiasts, or rather communities, uh, that were disjunct and not connected, largely motivated by non-commercial motives. Of course, there were commercial BT uh, BBSs, but uh, by far uh, not, uh, without much corporate or government influence, right? There was no Google and there was no, um, no ministry that uh, was putting censorship or something like that. Um, and uh, the BBS community is a distinct subculture, so um, it has different norms and it's different values, uh, different from the ham radio guys, different from free software guys. Of course, some overlap, but still uh, a separate uh, community with separate norms. What I personally think is the big um, loss other than the loss of picture on the screen, um, is that back then the networks were distributed. There was no single point of failure. The infrastructure was owned and operated by its users, by individuals. Um, the connection speeds were symmetric, um, and there was no like data center versus consumer separation that we have uh, in the internet day and age of today. And that's yeah. See, I see really think this autonomy and decentralization is is a big um, loss to society or uh, the community as a whole. Okay, some pointers uh, if you want to uh, read up more or look at some ANSI artwork or uh, log into BBSs. The Telnet BBS guide, I can highly recommend that. Um, you can also find the BBS I looked into. Um, okay, good. Which brings us to the point where we can have uh, some questions. The microphones here in number three, one, two, and four. But first, we have questions from the Signal Angel. So, what's the question for? Uh, the, the internet, internet wants to know uh, what was the highest phone bill you ever got back then. <laughs> ha. To be honest, I don't remember, but for sure it was uh, four digits. I'm quite sure it was it was it was uh, quite uh, devastating. Yes. There is another question from the internet. And there's another question. Um, uh, you mentioned that there are uh, very few books uh, around the, those topics. Uh, which ones would you uh, recommend regarding BBS, Usenet, uh, and so on? Uh, I cannot respond to this uh, directly. I don't remember. The, I, ca I, will, I can put it together and um, or people can reach out to me or I'll, I'll put it in the slides when I submit them into the, the, um, the FRAP system. Uh, sorry for that. So we have a question from the microphone number two, please. Yes, um, back in the 90s, most of the voice was uncompressed uh, and actually direct. Um, but mo modern technology is usually having voice always compressed, uh, transferred over IP. Uh, do you know of any modern modulation formats that actually can survive several codecs, voice codecs, for <laughs> data transmission? Um, I'm not the expert on that subject. I know there are some codecs, yes, but uh, they are extremely slow. So um, you, you are happy if you get something like 1,200 or maybe uh, uh, 2,400 BPS of data through a, a modem that uh, survives uh, multiple codecs. And then, of course, always the question of which codecs. Um. OK, microphone number four, please. OK, I don't have a question to highlight, actually, but thanks for the talk. I would like to ask the audience, because many, I think, users and operators of VBSs are here, who wants to meet this evening at, I would say, 9 o'clock in one of the seminar rooms for a talk about the back old times? <laughs> yeah, I would say some here. So I will try to lock in self-organized session at the seminar room 1415, I think it's called, at 9 o'clock. OK, thank you very much. So see you there and talk about the good days of, and some more stories, I think. <laughs> There are still more people queuing up. Microphone number four, please. I've got a question about the political bulletin board systems. Um, could you tell us a bit about the CLNet and um, the fascist clone, the Tulanet? Um, what was the dynamics back then and, and the fights? What, that, what were the conflicts in, the, in those boxes? 
I have to admit, I cannot uh, say too much about it. I know, of course, CLNets was a, a network uh, mainly uh, for left-wing political activists and groups. And yes, there was Tulenets, a right-wing uh, network. And I knew there was discussions and so on. And there were people trying to hack each, each other's mailboxes and so on. But um, I, uh, I was not participating or involving in, in, in these discussions uh, to an extent that I can really comment on it. Sorry. Microphone number one, please. Hi, Harald. I still remember when I started with an acoustic coupler, I did that because there was a severe threat of punishment if you used an illegal modem at the time from the Deutsche Bundespost. So uh, I was actually never aware that a little bit later you could actually do an end uh, a back to back DSL modem connection over an analog exchange. So at that time you did that. What was the, the punishment situation from the Bundespost or whatever it was called at the time if they would have ever caught you doing that? Do you remember? I have no clue. Yes, it, well, uh, sort of. Um, I mean, the, 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 how can I say, the, the, um, the criminal offense, I think, stopped in 92 when Deutsche Post was privatized. Um, so until 92, it was a criminal offense to operate a non-approved modem at the German telephone network because it was government-owned. It, so it was a crime, not, a, not a, a minor offense. But afterwards, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, I don't think anyone bothered at the time, and nobody. I mean, the, we, we never had any trouble uh, with these the DSL uh, uh, things and so on that we did over analog circuits. Microphone number two, please. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm from Taiwan, and I just want to share something interesting for everyone. Uh, in Taiwan, it's a small country in Asia. Uh, we are still using PBS, the largest site named PTT, and it supported use SSH or WebSocket to connect it. And its source code is available on GitHub. Everybody can search it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually not just for Taiwan, but you can find many, I mean, maybe it's more popular there still, but you can find many BBSs that are still in operation today in many different countries, uh, even also with um, uh, BBS software uh, that's uh, free software and that's maintained now on GitHub or on uh, and other repositories uh, with contributors and so on. So the, the community still lives, uh, but I think at least internationally it's, it's very small, um, and I'm happy to hear if it's larger in some countries. We have still time for questions. Microphone number four, please. So you talked about uh, restoring decentralization. So um, what uh, old systems would you like to see coming back? Something like uh, the Usenet? I mean, it's still there, but you can't access it without paying a lot of money to some big gateway. So which technologies would you like to revive or do you think are realistic to revive to, to have decentralization again? I don't think the technologies necessarily need to be revived because they are to a large extent old and uh, people are smarter and uh, the, the, the um, how can I say, the, um, the, the capacity and the computational complexity of what you can do today and so on is much better. So we can have much better technology. Um, but uh, the, the thing that I would like to see revived is more decentralization and more um, people operating their own technology. And that's just, I think, I don't really have a plan, and I'm not saying I have a vision, I'm just seeing it as a problem, this development, that uh, basically it's a consumer-producer model, and especially with content delivery networks and with uh, uh, attacks on network neutrality and, and, and all these topics, it's always moving in one direction. It's basically turning uh, the user into a stupid consumer and, and uh, making sure all the control and all the, the content uh, and so on is, is uh, in, 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 on, in, in the hand of large corporations. Ah, by the way, uh, one interesting anecdote about the, I, I talked about the asymmetry of the speed, right? And with, D, with DSL, at least ADSL and the popular technologies, always the, the downlink is bigger than the uplink. I know in Brazil, a lot of uh, people basically uh, in small, like uh, small size ISPs, they did it the opposite way around. So they did one modem with uh, basically a large downstream and small upstream, and then they, on, on an, another line next to that, they inverted it by using a master modem on one side and a slave modem on the other. So then again, you had symmetric speed. Um, so some people had uh, creative ideas to work around some of the technological restrictions. So microphone number two, please. Uh, I'm also from Taiwan, and I want to add something for my friend. 
like um, uh, there are still like half million people connect to BBS called PTT, yeah, today. And like uh, there's a there there are um, one hundred thousand people online now. Yeah, so I I think the community is not like. Uh, what is your little. question? Can you please no, I, phrase I just the want question? To, I just want to add something for my friend. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Um, <coughs> uh, um, you you told about uh, content of his uh, mailboxes. Um, isn't it that the uh, Fry from community today is a possible way to get this freedom back from what you what you had in your mailboxes? Um, the, the services they were offered there, uh, the Fry from could do the same today with uh, user own structures and so on. That's very correct, yes. Freifunk definitely is much more in the spirit of uh, the community-owned and community-run uh, systems, and I see lots of similarities between the BVS community and what Freifunk is doing today, is correct. Are you, are you doing something with Freifunk? Me personally, no. I'm okay. not uh, involved. Thank you. I think microphone number two is waiting way too long. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, most people didn't have a TCP IP capable uh, operating system uh, at this time. And uh, I started to read recently about an operating system called uh, Xenix, X-E-N-I-X, that was actually developed by Microsoft and published in 1983 that could run on uh, IBM uh, PC compatible uh, machines on the um, 86 uh, processors. And I hear that in uh, the Russian BBS systems, at least, it was very popular. Did you uh, encounter any Xenix uh, operating systems at that time? No, I personally did not encounter Xenix. I read about it, yes, and I know it. it I could have possibly run it on my 286 machine, but uh, I mean, I don't think it was something that was readily available for affordable price uh, to individuals, but maybe I'm wrong. No, certainly not. Okay, some people are heavily shaking their heads. I so think this is why it was popular in Russia. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> I do not want to comment on that. We have time for one more question. Okay, Thank I just you for number wanted to note, uh, in the wiki, the meeting is up. Search for BBS, and this evening at 9 o'clock, I think we can talk about all the details of running DSL on modem lines. I've also got some more details on that, and a lot of these modems left if you need some. But I think, so see you, Harold, at 9 o'clock? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay, everybody welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. <laughs>